All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And it's only Tuesday, so I guess I can still say welcome to reInvent 2023. I hope you enjoy this week. And thanks in particular for joining our session this afternoon. So my name is Dirk. I'm a principal solutions architect here at AWS. Yeah, my name is uh, Gregor. I'm part of our serverless engineering team. So about 20 years ago, I wrote a book about asynchronous messaging and integration patterns. And interestingly, they're still quite relevant today. And one of my beliefs is that we can learn a lot about architecture from the real world by looking how things function in the real world. So one of my most popular articles was about how you can learn about queuing three and two-phase commits by going to a coffee shop. But Dirk actually has an example that's a little bit closer to home, or at least closer to where we are here at reInvent. Exactly. So this is obviously a monolith. It's a quite impressive thing. And if you think about a software monolith, you can often imagine it comes with tight coupling between the components of the monolith and not enough cohesion within each component. So over time, when you further develop that uh, monolith, you will run into more and more problems. And one famous example is the spaghetti code, and also that deployments run forever and are quite error prone. But hey, nature has a solution to that as well. As you can see here, um, it carves out one of the painful services out of the monolith. And this is what customers often uh, do themselves. So identify one of the most painful um, systems and, and cut it out. And eventually, you will typically um, uh, end up with a landscape of systems um, that obviously need to be integrated with each other um, so that they can also communicate. And some of them are closer to each other, so they can be more tightly coupled, and some of them are rather far away. Um, this can typically be SaaS solutions or third-party systems in general. Oh, you were supposed to tell me that we can learn something. <laughs> there we go. Yes, and what we see here is that Integration used to be seen as something that you do sort of one time after the fact that you have these big systems and then you somehow wire them together and we called that integration. Now in the cloud, systems are fine-grained, they are distributed, they communicate through events. So integration now is an integral part of your application architecture and no longer an afterthought. Right, and integration has really many faces. So there are different uh, ways how to integrate systems, different approaches. You can see them all here. Um, file transfer is actually still around everywhere, although we might laugh about it. Uh, shared databases can be quite painful, but you will also find them everywhere. Um, then you have APIs and all their variations. Gregor has already mentioned he has written a book about uh, messaging 20 years ago, but also today streaming is a thing. So, oh my, a uh, lot of uh, options, and all this needs to be orchestrators, uh, orchestrated, or you need to have some choreography around it. So as an architect, I like doing two things. The one thing is I like simple pictures, because simple pictures force us to abstract and think about our architecture very clearly. So last year I gave a talk, I called it the blue boxes talk. So here we have two boxes, and they're obviously integrated, eight talks to be. But the second part for me that makes architecture is making decisions, making conscious decisions. So what turns out is that behind this simple diagram are actually quite a few decisions, right? Is this synchronous or is this asynchronous? Is this point-to-point, point, or is it publish, subscribe, or you have multiple receivers for the message. Is this actually message-oriented, or is it RPC, right? The arrow doesn't really say. Um, is this the data flow or the control flow? i come back to that later. That makes a huge difference. Um, is this in memory? Is this distributed? Um, is B a system or an instance of a system? How do you deal with failures, partial failures, the conversations, retries, backoffs? So there's an amazing amount of questions and architecture decisions behind these simple diagrams. And that's what we're actually going to try to do in this talk, 
drill down on these kind of interactions and give you guidance on how to make some of these decisions. Right, and for those we also need to manage expectations because unfortunately there is no architecture decision you take that comes without any trade-off. And even every architecture decision brings you some sort of pain. And, and your job as a software architect is to find in any context the architecture decision that brings you the least pain. So in the beginning we talked about integration and saying integration is no longer an afterthought. So that leads us to an interesting question. What is actually the difference between integrating something and building a distributed system? Because both would look like the two blue boxes with the line, right? Somehow we have multiple components that get connected, so where does the actual difference lie? Right? They would seem very similar. And interestingly, the difference isn't so much on the technical side. Technically, architecture, right? This is what they both look like. Somehow we connect two systems. But that's not the only part that makes up an architecture. It's not just about the purely technical aspects. It is also when are we doing this, how often do we do this, and how much control do we have over the items that we deal with. And that's actually where we notice the difference between data migration, integration, and building a distributed system. Like a data migration is something you would probably do only one time. Um, um, integration is probably something you also do once, but you run continuously. You know, we had a phase, I'm partly guilty of triggering the whole enterprise service bus movement. Um, I don't feel too bad about it. I think the technology was good. People went a little bit wild with it, but enterprise service buses have the idea that they're still somewhat separate from the application. It's something you develop continuously, but at a slightly different cadence versus in a distributed system, the cadence between updating your components and building your integration is no longer there. The boxes and the lines run in the same rhythm. They may be in the same code base even. They have the same kind of commits. So what you see is even though there's technically no difference, there's a big difference in the life cycle, the level of control you have. Like classic integration, you cannot change the boxes. So that has a lot of implication on your design. But in a distributed system, you build the boxes yourself. So you have full control over the boxes and the lines. And the third difference is the team setup, right? And I sort of joked about being partly guilty for triggering ESBs because they adopted all the patterns from the book. I think the ESB itself wasn't the problem. The problem was in the end that we had a very separate team saying, oh, we just do integration and you guys just do application and that never quite synced up. So what we are learning here is that the difference is actually not so much in the technology, even though we have different services that support these. The big difference is really in how the teams are structured, what's the cadence of development, and that what is the level of control. So when we talk about integration versus distributed systems, let's keep that in mind that we see the whole context, how that work is actually done, not just what the two, box, two blue boxes and the one line looks like. So what we want to do for the rest of the talk, as I promised, we're pretty much going to talk about the line. And as we already hinted, there are quite a few things to say about that line, so we're going to dive into those. So for, day, for today, we have four key elements that we think really make up the decision of what's between the two blue boxes, what's behind the line. The first is everybody's favorite word when we talk about anything, let's say connected, that's sort of my weasel word to get out of the distributed versus integrated. Anything that's connected, we talk about coupling. Then we'll talk about control flow and flow control. I gave a hint there, like data flow and control flow. So we'll dive into this. Then we talk about message ordering and delivery semantics, like at least once delivery, exactly once kind of delivery. And then we talk about a very important topic, which is error handling and replace. So, well, let's get started. Here's our favorite word, coupling. And we always want everything to be loosely coupled, but it's not that easy. First, we need to really understand what is coupling. We always say, well, coupling is bad, so we should decouple things. Like, well, that's, that's a little bit superficial for an architect. 
So the coupling is a measure of the independent variability between those beautiful blue boxes. Meaning, if B changes, does A also have to change? Or maybe the white arrow has to change. If they both have to change, they are coupled. If B can change without A changing, then they are less coupled. And pay attention here, I didn't say they are decoupled, because this is not a binary thing. Now, as computer science, we like to, everything to be binary, ones and zeros, right? But in the real world, and in this case, it's not that easy. Coupling isn't like either on or off, but it has a lot of shades of gray. So if you make more independent variability, they are less coupled. But things might be less coupled in one dimension, but more coupled in another one. And we'll see more, many examples of this. So for example, you might be decoupled from the choice of programming language or the location where B actually runs. You might decouple it from the IP address by having a DNS lookup or having a message channel, but you might still be coupled from a runtime perspective, right? If B fails, your A might also fail, or if B gets slow, A might get slow. So there are many dimensions of this. And Dirk hinted, everything has a trade-off, so coupling also, or decoupling has a cost. So we don't just decouple everything because we think that's somehow better. We need to decide what is the right level of coupling that best serves our system, because if we make everything decoupled all the time, that has a cost for design time, more complexity, more runtime, more moving parts. There are clear trade-offs here. So here's a small sampling of all the different dimensions, right? I hinted you might be loosely coupled from a location perspective, but tightly coupled from an availability perspective. And this goes through all these different dimensions. What are the languages? What are the data formats? What are the semantics of the fields that go between these two systems, right? The temporal dependency, that's what I hinted at, right? If B is slow, will A be slow? Or can they do that independently? So that's how coupling breaks down, and that's why it's not a binary condition, but all of these have shades of gray. So the important takeaway here is, as architects, we don't follow simple rules. We can't just say, oh, the more loosely coupled, the better. That is not true. The amount of coupling that your system should have really depends on the level of control you have over the endpoints. Because if you have control over both endpoints, then this change propagation, like if B changes and A has to change, that is actually not such a big problem. Think about two methods in your source code, right? You want to rename one method, and then all the callers have to rename, rename them. Well, that's a refactoring built into the IDE. It doesn't bother you at all. So that is tightly coupled, but you have full control, so that is not a problem. When you don't have control of other systems, that's when the decoupling is really important because B will change and maybe you cannot change A at the same time. That's when decoupling becomes important. So it's useful to us to understand these trade-offs. There's, it's not a like always or never kind of situation, but it's finding the right balance and understanding what that balance depends on. So one of our favorite constructs for decoupling, and here sort of contradict myself because I should probably say more loosely coupled, are queues. And queues have a couple of nice properties. A, they're very simple. Our two-box diagram didn't get a lot more complicated. All we did put that little pipe in the middle. And this helps loosen the coupling on multiple dimensions, which is really nice. So the location decoupling, A doesn't talk to B directly anymore, but it talks to this queue. So if B changes into something else, A doesn't have to change. Classic example of loose coupling. The timing also helps, right? If B is slow, and we'll talk about this later with flow control and control flow, you know, if B is slow, that doesn't actually bother A because A just like sends things into the, the queue. And you can also decouple the interaction style because all you do is package your data in a message and send it off. There's no call stack here, no, no callbacks, all these kind of complications go away. So the interaction style here is also nicely decoupled. So that's why we like to have queues, and Dirk will explain a little bit more what this async stuff looks like. Yes, I wanted to illustrate this a little bit um, by going one step back 
and walk you through an architecture evolution for a fictional ride-sharing uh, service. I guess you all know ride-sharing services, so don't have to explain uh, the business model. Now, in our fictional ride-sharing service, the marketing team is quite active and they run a campaign currently with a call to action, book your ride for next week or already this week. And um, they start with an architecture that uses um, synchronous communications via APIs. And this is what it looks like. So their end customers, they have an app. Um, they send their details for the rides that they want to book for next week to the back end. And this fires um, several downstream services. So the ride booking service orchestrates everything, but we have first level and even second level downstream services. We have an extern external payment service provider. And all this takes time. And since we have synchronous communications here, we bind resources during, along the request path um, during the entire processing time. And while this is fine, if you have medium or low load, it can jeopardize uh, the stability of your system under load. Because now the marketing team comes to the idea, hey, let's, let's run a bit uh, a more aggressive uh, campaign. For example, book your ride for next week already tonight, between 8 and 8.15 p.m. So that would concentrate the load on our system significantly. So how can we get out of this? First thing that our fictional company does is to move from synchronous communication via APIs to asynchronous communication via APIs. And this is actually natively supported by HTTP with post requests that are responded by 202 accepted. So that's nice. As we can see here, the requests are directly acknowledged and we don't keep um, the binding resources open all the time. Um, still, uh, of course, the request processing within every system takes the time, but we don't bind the resources while the example um, request is being processed. So with that, we have laid the foundation for being resilient for high load, and this brings us to the insight that friends don't let friends rely on synchronous integration. Unfortunately, thank you, unfortunately, there are still some coupling aspects left that might uh, lead to trouble under high load. So let's have a look back at uh, our, our situation. So we move to asynchronous communication via APIs. And I simplified the diagram here and left out the, the second level downstream services. So what we have here is the right booking service that sends requests to um, downstream systems. Now, what happens if one of those systems um, has a, a planned or unplanned uh, uh, downtime? Or what happens if one of the systems is currently overwhelmed for a few minutes by the re incoming requests? So as Gregor has explained before, we can replace this by queues. So queues now have um, the nice feature that they remove the runtime dependency between those systems. Because when you have um, communication via APIs, Apparently, both parties need to be online, otherwise there is no communication. And the queues decouple both sides from each other, so they don't even have to know anything about it anymore. And uh, I have um, omitted the re actual responses so far to uh, keep the diagrams digestible, and of course, there need to be responses back, in this case, to the right booking service um, eventually. And in this case, we have dedicated response queues for every of the downstream systems, but it actually depends on how you want to manage it internally. It can also be one response queue. The question that you might ask yourself now is, how can we actually make sure that the right booking service can uh, identify incoming responses, and how do those downstream services actually know where to send those responses to? For that, we have um, patterns that are called correlation ID and uh, return address. And as the name suggests already, the return address uh, pattern instructs to put some metadata into your message that then the downstream service can use to address the response queue. And the correlation ID is also meta information in, in a message that the responder adds to the response. So in this case, the right booking service can also identify the request that belongs to this response. So correlation ID and return address help here. And by the way, this is already relevant for asynchronous communication via APIs. 
Okay, and now that we got our downstream uh, services super, I shouldn't say decoupled, but less coupled, Correct. <laughs> we can come to the following insight. Loose coupling is mostly better than lousy coupling. Now you might ask yourself, what is lousy coupling? I like to call um, very, very tight coupling, lousy coupling, like shared databases or so, and to just to express that you can easily run into problems with that. And I also need to um, keep myself from saying always, because we heard several times before there are always trade-offs, and there is no always and no never. So in most cases, it is better, and particularly if you want to have um, flexibility and, and scale in your workloads. All right, so there's quite a bit behind this coupling story. Architecture is never as easy to say, oh, just loosely couple things. We need to understand the trade-offs and find the right balance. So that brings us to our second topic, and that is the topic of control flow and flow control, and this is not a word game. Both of them are actually inherent in asynchronous systems and a very important aspect of this design. And Again, it starts with the blue boxes and the white line. And earlier I mentioned, is this control flow or is this data flow? Now, data flow is easy to understand, right? A has something that B wants, so A passes this to B. Fine, no issues. But in reality, right, our systems have a control flow, right? We make calls, we pass messages, we pull for results. So the question is, uh, how are these two actually related? Well, it turns out in the case of queues and messaging, they look fairly similar because the data just goes in a message, goes from A to B. Fine, no issue. If you have RPC, it gets a little bit more nuanced. Yes, the data does go from A to B, a to B but there's also a response. So, and sometimes the response could be more interesting than what you send. So you're already starting to wonder, well, is my data flow really this way or is my data flow really the other way? Because either one could be part of an RPC. And then even more interestingly, and that's my favorite example, let's assume you're polling. You're actually polling information from the source. So here, your data flow and your control flow are actually the exact inverse of one another. Right? So when we draw these lines, let's be very clear. Is this the data flow, or is this the control flow, or is it both? Or in some cases, they actually have opposite directions. So because control flow is so important, we actually have a visual language for those. So some of these people, this is your know, flashback, you can tell from the sort of almost 80 styles icons because I took them exactly from the website from 20 years ago. These are the enterprise integration patterns that describe different ways of routing and transforming messages. There's 65 of them in total. I just picked a few that probably many of you actually know from like routing and filtering messages to splitting large messages into the pieces to transforming, enriching, or reducing sort of claim checking messages. Uh, slight trick question, does somebody know what that special icon is? Okay, there's a hand up. Spa, very close, split and aggregate, yes, and that has a special name? Scatter, gather. Right? And it's exactly split and aggregate, you're 100% on. The combination of that is scatter, gather, and apologies for the trick question, that icon is not actually in the book. I made that like 19 years later and just added it to the website. So that's a great thing of having a website, you can like keep adding things. So, so far so good, right? But this is data flow, right? This is a message comes in, I do something with this message, and the message goes out. That is purely data flow. So where's the control flow? So an old friend of mine, Ivan Gewurz, genius, came up and said, oh, we can extend this annotation. This was five years after we wrote the book, so this is not in the book but on the website. He said, we can make those icons more expressive. We can add the control flow to that. So the little nose means there's basically the active thread in the box and it sort of actively does something, either pushing or pulling, and then sort of the little nook 
right, that the nose goes into, that means it's a passive component that wants to be called from something else. And you can see sort of quite easily, right, like a puller is active at the front, it fetches the data from the lift, but it also wants to be fetched from the other side. So classic example where the control flow goes the other direction of the data flow. And now you can easily express something like a queue. A queue is not active on its own, right? A queue is something where you put data in and you actively pull it out. And as we'll see very soon, that gives us some very nice properties and we can easily express that by just making a box with two little, two little nooks on it. And that means that the control flow on both sides is actually the opposite direction, right? On one side, the control flow goes in. On the other side, the control flow goes in the inverse of the data flow. And that's the magical property of queues that they can invert your control flow. So this gives us very nice ways to think about this in a clear way and make visuals that communicate this very clearly, right? And you can have sources and destinations, right? They can be active or passive, just like the other ones. So now I work on the serverless team, right? So we have serverless integration, we have stub functions, we have event bridge event buses, we have event bridge pipes. So, well, let's see how those work by using those icons. So here's event bridge, right? Event bridge supports many sources and many targets. And again, that is data flow. But let's talk control flow because it gets a little bit more interesting. So event bridge is passive, right? The events get published by something. They might come off S3 or SNS, right? These events get pushed to event bridge, hence the little nose, right? And then event bridge has targets and filter expressions, right? So it can filter, transform, and root. So I express this here in terms of the icons and then it can publish the messages to target like SQS, right? And everything goes nicely from left to right and that's why EventBridge works very well. But there is another case. EventBridge supports a different kind of target. It supports an API destination. And an API destination is a little bit tricky because that is not a message-oriented API, API destinations are basically RPC. You're calling the destination and waiting for the result. This is HTTP. So now you realize, oh, something with this control flow here is different. API destinations are also rate limited, right? Because otherwise we would just destroy the downstream API, right? If one call takes, you know, five seconds and we hammer this, you know, with a thousand instances, that will not end well. So you have parameters like the invocation rate. And that gives you a hint, right? When somebody says, ooh, invocation rate, that is a control flow setting, right? It shows how many messages per second go in there. But that means that we have a additional element there, which I call a driver that maintains this flow rate. Now you have an interesting picture. You have two noses and you just learned what you do if you have two noses. You put something in with two nooks and that is called a Q, right? That's the only way this thing can match up. And yes, absolutely, EventBridge has a Q built in because otherwise this cannot function. And if you read the docs very carefully, they will tell you if you have an event pusher at the front, which all these sources are, but you have an API destination as a target, be careful with the time to live. If your arrival rate is enormous and your invocation rate is low, that queue will fill up and if you don't actually service those messages in the expiration time, in the time to live, the messages will just disappear. So the docs hint at this, but normally we don't have such a good vocabulary to express this and that's where these little nooks and noses actually come in really, really handy. Let's do one last one and I'm a big fan of event bridge pipes. And sometimes people say like, what's the difference between a bus and the pipe? And once we have the control flow, the answer becomes very simple. Pipes pulls. Pipes is active. It can read events from sources like SQS or from a DynamoDB stream. They don't actively push events out. You pull the events. Nose goes to the left side. So that means very clearly Pipes has a driver built in. And you see this in the settings. Right, the settings have a batch size and a batch window. Right, how often should I pull messages or when I get that amount of messages, then I pass it on. So I have control 
over the control flow in this case, right? And then on the consuming side, right, same as before, I just pipe the messages through. Same question we should ask, what if pipes goes to an API destination, which it can, it's a supported type, and again, we have the same challenges of this rate limiting because you don't want to overload your Dyn's downstream API. So in this case, something different happens. We don't need a queue because we control the arrival rate, right? We have the driver, so we don't need a queue. What we are doing instead is we are actually modifying the arrival rate to slow down to balance out, and we do this actively, we basically balance out how many instances of this we're running so that the polling rate and the downstream processing rate that you specify, that they actually reach an equilibrium. So the control flow is really important, and you can see how changing the target type really changes how the control flow inside our serverless integration services functions. So, for the Instagram moment, right? So the control flow is really essential to understand how these distributed systems function, right? The data flow is nice. It's like data goes from here to there, easy peasy. The control flow is what brings all the challenges. You know, how big is my queue, etc. So let's dive into this queue word, how big is my queue? So we come back to the queue and we like the two, blocks, two boxes and the line. Now let's talk arrival rate because I hinted at this a little bit. Like the queue has this magic property that the control flow at both sides is independent. So that means the arrival rate and the consumption rate can be different, right? Because you can pump into the queue pretty much as much as you like and you're pulling out of the queue at your preferred rate. That is temporal decoupling at work. The thing on the right hand side, the curve, has a different shape than on the left hand side and that's what we call traffic shaping, literally. The traffic has a different shape because it's temporarily decoupled. The control flow on both sides can vary independently. And that's very, very nice. That's what queues are for. But Dirk hinted, right, there's always sort of a trade-off. Well, what if the arrival rate is much bigger than the consumption rate? And I just hinted at that, right, with EventBridge. What do you actually do? Ultimately, the queue will fill up, right? Nothing is ever infinite. We scale pretty decent, but infinite is not a word that we use a lot in our specs, right? Ultimately, this thing will fill up. So something has to give. And that's where we come to flow control. So we discussed control flow. Now we're in flow control, right? Stuff keeps coming in. Consumer is slow. What can we do? Well, it turns out there's two patterns that help us here that you can choose from. And that is basically either you get rid of old messages or you limit the arrival of new messages, right? It's very logical. It's one or the other has to give. You got to slow down the arrival rate or you got to be shedding old stuff. And those have a name. It's called time to live. And the other one is called back pressure. For time to live, we actually have settings for that, right? On our queue, you can specify that so that pattern maps very easily to our concrete implementation. Key thing I remind folks here is time to live is always, it makes people uneasy to make this setting. They're like, oh, my messages are going to die, right? It seems like a very bad thing to do. Like how long, how long does my message have to live? And we feel very guilty about setting a time to live. But the reality is every message has a time to live. If you have the winning lottery ticket in 20 years, you're not going to get your money, right? So ultimately, everything has a final time to live. So think carefully about it because that's one of the key mechanisms that you have to manage your queues. If you don't do that, your queues will fill up and your system is not going to behave the way you like. Now, back pressure doesn't have a built-in setting and that is because in a queue system, the queue doesn't know where the messages come from. So it doesn't have a magic setting to limit the arrival rate, so we do this manually. And here's a classic example of an overflowing queue. Um, this is from last year, I'm sure this year is similar. If you go down to serverless presso, the queue is relatively long because we only have two baristas and everybody likes the system and likes to get a free drink. So this system is actually built on a step function orchestration. So there's a step functions workflow in here. And here is a step that checks if there is capacity. And if there's no capacity, it sort of goes off to the side and it basically says, hey, sorry, you can't order a coffee right now. 
So these patterns are very real, and I mentioned at the beginning, I believe we can learn a lot from real life. Well, there you learn something about queuing three theory, and you learn something about back pressure from real life coffee shop. So to wrap this up is the magic of cues is that they decouple the control flow, right? The two noses go in opposite directions, so they decouple, temporarily, de temporarily decouple the control flow, but they can only do that if you manage the flow control, right? If you have either a time to live or back pressure, otherwise they cannot do that. And that brings us to our next segment. Exactly, which is order and delivery semantics. And when it comes to order, FIFO channels are a common pattern to accomplish this. And let me start this with a provocative statement. Message order is frequently requested and from time to time even with good reason. So there are certainly situations where you need this, but our mental laziness makes us want to have it all every time and we tend to ignore the trade-offs. So let's have a look at how FIFO queues work and what the trade-offs are that come with it. So as the overall topic says, it's about order. We want to have the messages that we send into a queue uh, dequeued in the same order. So a strict order for message delivery. But if you think about it, how can you reach this? Um, if you scale out your messaging system um, to, to a very large extent, you probably can imagine that it becomes more and more difficult to retain order within your messages. And that has nothing to do with bad software or something. It's more uh, the law of physics. And uh, even more, um, in the first example, we only saw one single consumer. But what if we have multiple consumers? If we apply the concurrent consumer pattern. So let's have a look at that one example here. We have four messages that go into a FIFO queue. We have three concurrent consumer consumers. and they do their work now. They receive messages from the queue in the order those messages went in. But here you can also see there are responsibilities not only in the messaging system, but in this example also on the consumer side. Because we cannot say in advance how much time each message takes to be processed on the consumer side. And in this case, message A was just quicker to be processed than message Message B um, was quicker to be processed than message A. And this is why it then uh, violated the order in the end. So just using a FIFO queue uh, stand alone doesn't help here, but there's another pattern that does the job. And this is called message groups. And um, what are message groups? It's in the end a discriminator attribute that you can add to your messages. And um, the way how Amazon SQS implements, this, implements it are message groups IDs. Let's look at another example. So here we have three message groups, and you can see them um, with the colors blue, green, and orange. Now, we have two concurrent consumers, and let's see what happens in this case. So again, messages are consumed in the order they went in. Oh no, B is uh, again faster. And, and now what you can see here, actually, the next message that should have um, sent to a consumer is message C. But now this is the way how message groups work. So as long as there is an in-flight message of a given message group, and in-flight message means it is currently being processed and not yet acknowledged, um, the FIFO queue will not send another message or uh, give out another message of the same message group to another consumer. And this is why message D appears here first. Okay, let's continue. Now that message A is also being processed, we can uh, receive message C, and in the end, we have a result that still hasn't retained the overall order of our messages, but what you can see here is that the message order within each group has been maintained. Um, that also means you can scale out on the consumer side depending on the number of message groups that you set up. So, and that also brings us to the insight that the order of messages in distributed systems is relative to a defined scope, in this case, the message groups. Now, 
What if you want to discuss local versus global message order? What we have just seen with message groups is a local message order. A global message order would mean that you create one message group ID for every message. And that would bring you back to sequential processing and to something like sequential database writes. Now, if you're interested also in PubSub messaging, um, the good news is that there are also FIFO topics. And here, it's also a bit simpler because we don't have concurrent consumers with uh, topics, right? Um, and if you want to make use of um, the topic queue chaining pattern to get the best of both worlds, um, the way how it is implemented in SNS and SQS is that uh, the message group IDs are forwarded from the FIFO topics to the FIFO queues, and you can get um, the order semantics through topics and queues alike. Right. Um, another aspect that is often, often discussed is uh, deduplication. And you might recall um, the schema of this provocative statement in the beginning. Message deduplication is frequently requested and from time to time even with good reason. So what options do we have? Let's look again at SQS FIFO. So on the producer side, we have message deduplication IDs which we can apply. And then again, we need to limit the scope a little bit to make it manageable, and this is for five-minute intervals. On the consumer side, we have the means of receive request attempt ID. It's a bit of a cumbersome word, but it also helps you for deduplication on the consumer side. But then there's also um, the message visibility timeout, and um, this might also reduce the scope, and, and you, you can come to a situation that the same message is eventually re-delivered. So then again, um, the scope that we have just seen brings us to the insight that also deduplication of messages in distributed systems is relative to a defined scope. Now, if you really look for something like exactly once, um, you should again, as always, think about what you really want. Even if we apply all the means that we have just seen, what can happen in practice? You have a consumer of message A in this case, and during processing there are three downstream systems. Um, working with the first one works perfectly fine, and in the second one you run into an exception. So what behavior do you want now? Do you want this message to be not delivered again, or do you want to fix your code and have that message be delivered again? This is something you, you need to be clear of. And, and again, if, if you really um, are extreme with your requirements um, and, and say, I can only work with um, exactly once delivery, you end up back at something like synchronous integration or shared databases. So the last aspect of distributed systems that we want to touch is error handling and replay. And we start with poison pills and dead letter channels. And this, that's actually a quite um, ubiquitous uh, quote of uh, Werner Vogels, our CTO, and it's actually right. Everything fails all the time. This is why you should be prepared to handle failure. Um, and that letter cues is a pattern that comes in quite handy here. So what do they do? How does that work? Let's imagine we have again a message consumer that runs into an exception every time when it processes message C in this example. So and if this happens in a repeated fashion, we can distinguish between two cases. The first one is a transient failure. So this means that most likely in a few minutes, seconds, whatever, this message can be processed because there is a state change to be expected on the consumer side. But then there are also poison pills. And that doesn't necessarily to be something harmful, but it just means that this message will never be successfully processed because of an assumption that never uh, comes into action or because of a bug in the code. Now, what you want to do here is that you don't reprocess that message in, um, for, for a gazillion of times. You would rather want to take it out of the game and park it in a dead letter queue. And there you can um, investigate on why your processing fails without the hassle of production. So not do an open heart surgery. So 
as I said, um, everything fails all the time, or actually Werner said it, uh, I just repeated it. So failure is inevitable. You should embrace failure and plan with it, and let also the tools help you. And there is also some experience that Gregor can share with that. Yeah, I also failed, because everything fails all the time. So um, who, has, who has built an infinite loop with like a message or event-driven system? Okay, and notice I'm raising my hand. Okay, welcome. Welcome to the club. Um, I call this tuition. It's part of the learning experience that you have. So here is my story of making an infinite loop and a little bit of advice how to, how to get out of it. So I built a splitter, right? One of the fundamental patterns, a message has, yeah, they're usually JSON messages for us. They have a, an array in them. So I split this into individual messages, very classic kind of pattern, so I built this with my favorite service, EventBridge Pipes, because Pipes has this enrichment element where it can call a lambda function, and that lambda function cannot just do enrichment, it can also do splitting. So I'm like, great, messages come in, I, you know, they're in the DynamoDB table, I split them into individual messages because maybe I want to route them to different places, so I send these off to the EventBridge bus. Now, before late, I made a message that has more than 10 elements in it, and what turns out is that these targets have a batch size limit, in this case of 10. So as Dirk sort of hinted, this is classic poison message, right? The message will not be processed because the target fails, but sure and enough, the next time, my splitter does the same thing it did last time because nothing ended, so basically, congratulations, that was my first infinite loop. So I got safe, well, A, I learned something, so there's a maximum retry attempt setting on the polar, right? As I said, EventBridge Pipes has control over the control flow because it actively pulls. So it can choose whether to get the message again or not, and that has a setting. And read the fine print, if you not have that setting, it is infinite. And again, infinite, I said, is a word we don't use a lot. So when you do see it, you should you know, probably be a little bit alarmed and set this setting because nothing is ever infinite. But the good news is what saved me in the end is we have a back off policy. So initially, this will retry at a second interval. And then pretty quickly, it backs off to a minute interval. So I let this run for a day or so, but it wasn't actually that bad. But yes, coming again, right, that little arrow, the control flow has a lot of implications, and once something hits an error, you know, the control flow sort of repeats itself, so you need to be very, very clear what behavior you want to have at that point, because if you don't, you're gonna join the infinite loop club. And that comes to my clever statement, and that is, nothing has brought more systems down than retry logic. Right? It seems so great to have a retry, oh, it didn't work, let me try this again. But what happens is a small disturbance in the system sort of becomes a big disturbance because everything starts retrying, and that is guaranteed to ultimately bring your system down. So be very careful. This is now back off, jitter, right? There's some nice articles we've actually published. Those are the keywords to make sure that that doesn't happen to your system. We have one subtopic left in the section, archive and replay. And now that we have looked at cues and topics uh, for a bit, um, let's also talk about um, the message bus in these um, example architectures. Um, what, what do we want to reach with uh, archive and replay in the first place? So let's have a look at this example here. So, you send uh, messages into a message bus. The message bus sets up an archive and stores the messages there. You have your consumers receive the messages at the same time. You can even add more resilience with a queue. Now, a queue helps you from uh, outages. It stores the messages for you. It allows you to um, consume the messages at your own individual pace. But once you have consumed those messages, they are gone from the queue. And if you um, realize only later that there was a bug in your code, you probably want to reprocess these messages. And this is where the archive and replay functionality comes into play. Now, if you do this with, for instance, uh, Amazon EventBridge, you need to be aware that the uh, message IDs are now different than from the original message. 
And this is why you should do it and also in general um, do it to not use a low level technical ID to identify a message, but rather use something like a higher level business ID. So with that, you are able to identify if you have seen a message before. And we have not really spoken about one aspect that actually comes into play with uh, many of those patterns that we have seen before. You should really consider to implement your consumers in an idempotent manner. Because in almost every case, and also think about the failure scenarios that we've seen before, you will have to reprocess and reconsider a message that you have seen before. And also consider downstream systems every time, right? So this is something you should really um, take care of. With that, we come back to the original statement, trying to manage ex expectations, that no architecture decision you take comes without a trade-off, and there's always some kind of pain attached. Right, but uh, independent of that, we also have another aspect, which is cloud automation. Yep, and we've given you a lot of smart architecture advice, how to manage your control flow, the flow control, the retries. So the amazing thing in the cloud is, of course, that's not just on paper, but that is actually programmable, right? We have the APIs, we have the CLIs, we have the console that allows you to program that. And I'm a big fan, so I'm working on serverless and, and CDK, mostly the combination of the two. And I've, I'm really convinced that automation is such an important part of the cloud that if you take it out of the picture, basically you have not much left but sort of a good old data center, right? Automation is not a nice to have, sort of where, oh, I build it sort of with ClickOps and when I have time I kind of sort of automate it because it's tedious. No, it's actually an integral part of building these kind of systems and expressing all the kind of aspects that we just talked about. So when we talk about automation, we usually think about sort of removing toil, right? I could do this manually, but I automate it so I don't have to do it every time. But cloud automation actually does a lot more than just that. So of course, yeah, we call it infrastructure as code. So one thing it will do is we'll provision resources. And I have a very simple example here of like, you have a couple of VMs, you know, uh, maybe autoscaler, load balancer, and API gateway on, fr on front of it. So yes, you will provision these resources. But of course, on their own, these resources don't do a lot. Actually, they do nothing. So you need to deploy some code on it, right? So your automation also deploys, but then Still, that doesn't do anything because you need to connect the pieces, right? We talked a lot about the lines today. So cloud automation also defines the lines, right? You're reading from this queue. You're getting events from this SNS. You have event source mapping for your Lambda function, right? Those are basically the lines that compose and show really the, the topology, right? All the pictures that we've drawn, that finds itself in your you know, Terraform or CloudFormation or CDK code, right? That's where that actually lives. And then on top of this, you probably have some configuration, right? This can be logging levels or primary, secondary, sizing, many, many other things. So just as a quick reminder that when we talk automation, a lot of the things we talked about find themselves here, right? We talked about the setting, like the max retry counts, the time to live, the message visibility, that is all in our automation code, and that's actually a very nice thing. So that leads us in the systems that sort of Dirk and I build and the examples that we have, that is no longer infrastructure as code, right? This is really your application architecture as code. Flow control, control, control flow, timeouts, message delivery, retries, error handling, right? That is really your architecture, and you should be looking to express that kind of architecture in your CDK or CloudFormation or Terraform code. Now there you find something pretty interesting, and in a way this is only a tiny teaser to another talk that I'm giving is that the current cloud automation tools, they really define a resource hierarchy, right? And for traditional resources, this makes sense, right? You have an availability zone, and inside you have a VPC, and you have an autoscaling group, and inside you have an EC2 instance, right? Sort of classic nesting. But 
none of our pictures look like this, right? All the pictures that we drew actually are interested in, well, data flow and control flow as you just learned. So the work that I'm doing is actually to rethink the programming model. So in CDK that we no longer just define this hierarchy, but that we get better at actually defining this control flow. And there's sort of my always my, my slight criticism, right? We talked about a lot of these really important settings, right? You have an API destination, the control flow changes, you need a max retry count, right? You have a message visibility timeout, but in reality, they're just like a few string and integer things in your cloud automation code, and I feel that that really underrepresents the complexity of the machinery you have behind, right? You put a few magic strings in there and suddenly your infinite loop goes away, right? Oh, that's amazing, right? But did I know that that little integer number has exactly that behavior? So that's, you know, just sharing a little bit where my brain is at. I don't have all the results yet, but I feel that we can make much more expressive and I would call this like a technical domain model, right? Like DDD style things, so that we can express all these things much better. Like where is my back pressure object, right? Like if I make a queue, and we just learned, right? If you have a queue, you need flow control. You either need time to live or you need back pressure. So why doesn't the queue constructor require me to pass in an object which is called flow control, which has two subclasses, one just time to live and the other one is back pressure, right? That's how we would normally think about this from an object-oriented domain modeling aspect. So I find this super interesting, so I just wanted to share what I'm tinkering with to bring basically that kind of expressive, expressiveness of the code into our cloud automation. And the tools we basically have, because CDK is object-oriented, so what I just said is totally doable. We have subclasses and argument types, right? You can do this easily in TypeScript or in any other languages. So I've blogged about this. I have a talk about this at this event, but unfortunately that one is in German because it's at the Global Lounge. So if you speak German, you're welcome to come to GBL 301. Otherwise, here's a QR code um, to a blog post that I wrote just on this topic to bring all the things we talked about back into your programming model so that you can actually see in your automation code what all your error handling, retry, flow control, control flow, what all these things are. Well, that brings us pretty much to the end here. Uh, some people know I like to write books. Luckily, I don't live from selling books, so if you like them, great. If not, I'll be equally happy. But have architectelevator.com. That's where I blog and sort of share what I'm normally doing. And if you want to get your hands dirty, I recommend uh, to have a look, look at our hands-on workshop called Decoupled Microservices. I should not call it Decoupled Microservices, right? Less coupled. Less coupled, <laughs> right. I will work on that. <laughs> and you can also ask your friendly AWS Solutions Architect to run an immersion day based on that workshop with you. And we also have a few other sessions that we would like to recommend to you. Yeah, and really quickly, this is the serverless land link here, so video, oh, yeah. slides, all the other stuff goes on there, so everybody got it? Cool, so we go, next slide. Right, so um, same topic, uh, integration um, is a uh, chalk talk on, on Thursday about how you can use uh, AWS uh, Cloud Native Serverless Messaging Services for workload resilience and, and ordering, and we also have another nice talk do modern cloud apps lock you in? Yeah, I'm always very proud to be able to give a talk with the words lock in in the title, not an easy feat, so please come and listen to my, my thoughts about switching cost and lock in because we talk a lot about serverless, right? So that is a, a topic you should think about, but maybe differently than you do, and I will explain in my talk what that is all about. And then last thing is serverless presso. Hopefully the, flow, the back pressure isn't in, in, in action by the time you go, but please visit our serverless presso booth, get a free coffee, learn about serverless architectures, and go ask those folks what they're doing for control flow and flow control. Thank you very much. Right? Right. <laughs>